Welcome to Trinity Church Bristol on this Sunday afternoon at 4pm. It's wonderful to have you join us today. Uh, we continue our journey through Mark's Gospel and it is a particularly challenging passage today so that's why we're going to have our confession after today's talk as we encounter this issue of religious fraud. Uh, the people who ran the temple weren't particularly um, genuine and that looks deep within our own hearts so we'll, we'll move the order of things around a bit and then don't forget after the YouTube part we meet more personally on Zoom so we can catch up and pray for each other and uh, share news and all that kind of stuff. For now though we're going to open with a song which explains why Jesus died. Also it shows us the difference that makes to our lives in our change of status uh, and then immediately afterwards Alex will bring us today's prayers so get ready to pray immediately after the song. Let's begin by singing. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, thanks for what we've been seeing in Mark's Gospel about what kind of shepherd king the Lord Jesus is. Thank you that all our dreams and aspirations of compassionate and just leadership and rule are met in him. Thank you for the blessing that it is to follow him, not just in the life to come, but also in this life. Thanks for his servant leadership, serving us ultimately by dying on the cross to pay the debt of your judgment on our sin, a debt we could never pay. 
thanks that greatness in your eyes means serving others and putting them first. We're conscious of how slow and resistant we can be in following Jesus on the way. And we ask for your ongoing help moment by moment to deny our own selfish impulses and desires and to know the joy and freedom of self-forgetful service. Amen. You know how we struggle at times to work out how to respond to current events in the world, which seem the most tumultuous of our generation. Thanks that Jesus knew that there would be upheaval in this period after his death and before his return, that it would be normal experience. Thanks that he told us to stay awake spiritually, understanding what your revealed will is in the Bible, seeking to trust and obey you, to endure hardship and any persecution, and seeking to prayerfully proclaim the gospel in word and make it attractive with our lives and loving relationships. We pray for godly action in response to racial tensions. Please would churches globally, and also our own church, model what it is to have unity and diversity across ethnicities. Show us please where we're prejudiced and how we can repent and establish cultures that glorify you more and more. We pray too against bad, unintended or intended consequences of efforts to maintain peace and establish justice in social diversity. Please would freedom to proclaim the gospel be protected for as long as you wish and would we make use of that freedom. Please guard our hearts and tongues as we take in news and social media. Give us discerning spirits to understand the times and take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Please would our speech be gracious and insightful, seasoned with salt. Amen. We pray for those serving Christ overseas at the moment, where the lockdowns are affecting their ability to leave their country or causing serious social unrest. Please watch over them, protect them while they seek to do good in their contexts. We pray for those Greg and Rosno in South America and for someone we know called Hannah in a very hot Muslim country in North Africa where they've been unable to leave and temperatures are going up to 50 degrees centigrade. Please help them to adjust to the temperature and find solutions to the health impact. Please work for good through this and give them opportunities to glorify you before those who live there. Please give them wisdom as they consider how to structure their work in that country. Please fill them with loving discernment and prosper their efforts. Amen. Finally, we pray you would bring glory to your name through our church, Trinity. Thanks for gathering us week by week, even online. And we pray that you would continue to do that and that we would look to you to help us to spur one another on and to reach out. Thank you for feeding us week by week in Mark and for upcoming series in the Psalms, Hebrews and Revelation. Please help those handling your word as they prepare. And we pray that we would pay careful attention to what we hear and stick close to Christ. Would we not drift into half-heartedness or even shrink back when following Christ feels more costly than before? We pray that we would excel in the gift of hospitality formally and informally, via technology or in person. Please help us to open our hearts, our lives, our free time, our gardens, mobile phones, laptops to one another all the more, as we are aware that lockdown restricts the usual provision of gathering and encouragement. Help us all please to be those who keep going at things and take the initiative with others, just as you persisted and took the initiative with us in the Lord Jesus. We pray that as lots of us are active in loving fellowship, we would all be blessed and have a full understanding of your goodness in Christ. We pray that this would bring glory to your great name. And we pray all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus, who served us and died for us. Amen. 
Coming next, we have our Bible reading and our talk combined. After that, we'll have our confession and we'll finish with a song. So now would be a great time to be reaching for that Bible and turning to Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11. And perhaps if you're of the note-taking variety, you might also want to consider a notebook and pen. Welcome everyone, my name is Chris. Great to have you with us. As we continue in Mark's Gospel, in our passage today, the tension is mounting as Jesus finally arrives in Jerusalem to the temple of God. And as we enter Jerusalem, all the threads from the story so far begin to come together. So in the last few chapters, we've been on the way to Jerusalem where Jesus has said that he will come to die. The Pharisees have been plotting to kill Jesus since chapter 3, and Jesus has told us repeatedly that he has come into this world in order to die. So he is deliberately going up to Jerusalem in order to be killed, to give his life as a ransom. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die as a suffering servant. But that's not all he's going to do. At the very beginning of the book, Mark reminded us of this from the book of Malachi, right at the end of the Old Testament. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. In other words, God himself will visit in the temple and that will be a day of purifying judgment. Mark's point is that Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem is God visiting his people in purifying judgment. The Lord will suddenly come into his temple, verse 1. And verse 2 says he's like a refiner's fire. A refiner's fire melts down precious metals and separates out the impurities and burns them up, leaving the gold or silver behind pure. So Mark is saying that in Jesus, God is visiting his temple. And this visit is one of purification, getting rid of what is corrupt and defiled. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem to judge like a purifying fire. So this arrival in Jerusalem is loaded with significance, loaded with excitement, anticipation, tension, danger and joy. God the King arrives the suffering servant, the humble saviour, and the purifying fire. Haram is going to bring us our reading from Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphaga and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and one said to them, and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. 
and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields and those who went before and those who followed were shouting Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David Hosanna in the highest and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs, and he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. The first thing we're going to see is that King Jesus brings salvation. This is a really visually dramatic episode, isn't it? Jesus rides into Jerusalem and people spread their cloaks on the road and lay down leafy branches on the road before him. It's a bit like they're rolling out the red carpet. Somebody really important has arrived and the people know it. And the people, they're shouting out, they're singing for joy, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. What must the atmosphere have been like? It must have been utter joy, relief, hope for a better future. A bit like those street parties that you see when war is over. A feeling of national optimism. Things can only get better. And yet this is even more significant than that. See, the reason that the people are singing is that they know that salvation has come. They know that Jesus is the king and the kingdom of God has come. The long promised fulfilment of all of God's promises has finally arrived. Hundreds of years of waiting is over. Mark records the people singing words from Psalm 118, a psalm about God bringing salvation through his king. And Jesus is encouraging it. Gone are the days when he was secretive about his identity and his mission. Gone are the days when he only revealed it to his disciples until the time was right. It's out in the open now. Just look at this from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So it's a huge statement to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey with this written hundreds of years earlier. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He rides in on a donkey to say, I am this king, the one who is going to bring peace and rule over the whole earth. See, this is more than optimism that things might get better. This is the anticipation of the imminent arrival of the kingdom of God. This is the humble saviour's triumphant arrival. King Jesus brings salvation. The people in Jerusalem that day knew that this was the beginning of the most significant events in all of human history. Now, they might not have understood exactly how. There are some more twists and turns left in this gospel, as we're soon going to see. But fundamentally, they're right. Jesus's arrival in Jerusalem is huge. He's about to come and bring everlasting salvation and establish the kingdom of God. This is more significant than any other event in human history. More significant than the moon landing or the invention of the printing press or 9-11 or the end of the Second World War or the invention of electricity, you name it. Jesus coming to Jerusalem 
to bring everlasting salvation beats all of those things. King Jesus brings salvation. And yet there is a tension, a dark cloud over this triumphant arrival. Tensions have been brewing all the way through the book between Jesus on the one hand and the Jewish religious leaders on the other. And these tensions really bubble over in these next few chapters. Jesus comes to bring salvation, but he also pronounces judgment and the end of the temple. That's our second point. King Jesus pronounces judgment. All through the Bible, salvation and judgment come together. And the arrival of Jesus to Jerusalem is no different. King Jesus pronounces judgment. So firstly, we have this episode where Jesus spots a fig tree in the distance. And though we're told it isn't the season for figs, the tree is in leaf. And since the leaves are there, it's reasonable to assume there'll be some fruit as well. So Jesus comes and has a closer look. But seeing no fruit, he says to the fig tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. What are we supposed to make of this? What's this story about a tree doing here? Well, Mark orders his gospel very carefully, and this is no exception. We have in this section a sandwich. We've got a section about the fig tree, then a section about the temple, and then another section about the fig tree. And in this case, the outer sections explain the bit in the middle. You see, when Jesus gets to the temple in verse 15, he's not happy. He drives out those who are changing money and selling pigeons. He says to them that although Isaiah spoke of a day when God would establish what he called a house of prayer for all nations, where people from every nation would come to God for forgiveness and relationship, what Jesus sees in the temple is more like a den of robbers than a house of prayer. What exactly does he mean? Well, the money changers and the pigeon sellers are not the problem. In fact, you need money changers and pigeon sellers at the temple. See, people would come from all over the world to the temple in Jerusalem to make a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins and to pray. To so say you've come from far away, or you need to change your currency, and then you need to buy a pigeon to sacrifice for forgiveness. The money changers and the pigeon sellers aren't the problem. The problem is something that runs much deeper, and the key is in this phrase that Jesus uses, den of robbers. It comes from the book of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 7, God says this, Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. The point is that the people in Jeremiah's day were hypocrites. They were living like pagans, breaking all the commandments, worshipping other gods, and then coming into the Lord's temple and saying, we are delivered, only to go on doing the very same things. They were trusting in the fact that they had this temple, this privileged status, this amazing access to God, and yet, like the fig tree, they weren't bearing any fruit Now, Jesus, by using this phrase, den of robbers, 
is making the point that the chief priests and the scribes are just like the people in Jeremiah's day. They're hypocrites. And so look what Jesus does in Mark 11, verse 15. He began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. You see, Jesus is not cleansing the temple so that it can run as it should. He is shutting the temple down. That day, if you went to the temple, you couldn't buy a pigeon to sacrifice. You couldn't have it carried through to be offered on the altar. Nobody could go in or out, verse 16. You couldn't go into God's house. You couldn't have access to him. You couldn't be forgiven. Jesus didn't allow it. What we're seeing here is King Jesus pronouncing judgment. His verdict on God's people is that they are full of hypocrisy. They dishonour their God by presuming to come into his temple. And yet, for the most part, their lives are utterly indistinguishable from the nations around them. And so he, he teaches the crowds and he gives this verdict. This place is like a den of robbers. You are no better than the Jeremiah generation. Like the fig tree, Israel has produced no fruit. You see how the fig tree helps us understand what's going on in the temple. The fig tree had lots of leaves, but when they got up close, there was no fruit. The religious life of Israel, lots of leaves, lots was going on in the temple, lots of activity, lots of religious devotion, but no fruit, no righteousness. That's Jesus' verdict. And so Jesus shuts it all down. King Jesus pronounces judgment. We need to know that Jesus does bring salvation and pronounce judgment. We must acknowledge that pronouncing judgment is part of his mission, especially on those who outwardly look very religious but consistently reject their God. See, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they've consistently rejected Jesus and his teaching all the way through the Gospels. And so in turn, Jesus finally rejects them. We need to allow ourselves to be confronted by this as it sometimes makes us uncomfortable. But this is a really important part of Jesus' mission to come and pronounce judgment. It's been there right since Mark introduced his gospel to us. King Jesus comes to bring salvation and to pronounce judgment. Let's also recognise that he is kind to pronounce judgment before judgment falls. See, through the Old Testament, God's dealings with his people were never rash, never disproportionate. He is so patient with his people time and time again. He warns them. And this instance is no different. Even as the old covenant is coming to a decisive end, as Jesus comes into his temple in judgment, he warns ahead of time. He is kind to pronounce judgment before judgment falls. And let's also recognise that there is a comfort in this judgment itself. See, when we consider the kind of hypocrisy and the corruption that was present in the religious life of the nation, we do see that the judgment was right. We will see evidence of this next week as we read lots of confrontations between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. But even in that phrase, den of robbers, Jesus is comparing that generation to the generations of old. And if we know anything about the history of Israel in the Old Testament, then we know what he means. Hypocrisy and corruption of any sort 
stirs up strong emotions in us, doesn't it? We do feel a certain righteous, just anger at corruption when we see it in our world. When we see corruption in the people of God and hypocritical, phony religion, it's even worse. There is a comfort to know that Jesus sees and Jesus knows and does something about it. King Jesus pronounces judgment. What do you make of this Jesus? King Jesus comes to bring salvation and to pronounce judgment. Lastly, and more briefly, we end on a hint of hope. See, the next day the disciples walk past the same tree and we read that it has withered away to to its roots. Peter cries out, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Jesus, look at the tree, it's dead. There's more going on here than just the death of a tree. That parallel with the temple is really important. See, Peter is distressed, not because the poor tree is dead, but because of the implications for the temple. If Jesus pronounces judgment on the fig tree and the next day the fig tree is dead, what's going to happen after the temple, after what we saw yesterday? And if our temple is doomed, then what does that mean for our relationship with God, for forgiveness? What's going to happen to the nation and to their access to their God? This is what's troubling Peter. And this makes sense of Jesus' response in verse 22. See, in these verses, he's saying, despite what will be the end of the temple religion, forgiveness and access to God will be made available another way. Jesus pronounces judgment and the end of the temple, but he also announces something new. Verse 22. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Now on their own, these are tricky verses, aren't they? But you see how the context really helps us make sense of them. Peter is rightly alarmed. If the temple goes the same way that that fig tree did, then how will we be forgiven? Relationship with God is impossible without a temple, isn't it? God has met with his people either in the tabernacle or in the temple in Jerusalem for thousands of years by this point. It's almost beyond imagination that God would meet with people any other way. But Jesus says it will be possible that God will make a way. Have faith in God, he says. The impossible will be made possible. The impossibility of relationship with God and forgiveness without a temple will become possible. That's why he uses such strong language. If you'd have said to a Jew in the first century that you could relate to God without a temple, well, they would have thought that as impossible as asking a mountain to get up and throw itself into the sea. Forgiveness prayer, relationship with God, all these things will be made possible in a new way, through faith, without the need for a temple. Whilst judgment is falling on Israel, a new salvation is going to be made available. King Jesus brings salvation. He pronounces judgment whilst announcing the start of something new. Let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us to think rightly about the Lord Jesus, that he comes bringing salvation and also pronouncing judgment. 
Pray that you'd help us to see the goodness in that, that it is right, that it is part of his mission, that it is necessary. And we do thank you for this assurance that forgiveness and relationship with you are possible, even without a temple. Thank you that by faith we can come to you in prayer and find forgiveness through the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. And we pray in his name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever felt like a religious fraud yourself. I know that I do. It's a common problem, actually, in church life that on Sundays we tend to be on best behaviour because everyone can see us, and then midweek things can slip. We want to keep integrity in the way that we live, and it does seem to make some sense to put the confession after today's reading and talk. So if this is something that plagues you or you, you feel it's challenged you today, consider the words coming up on the screen and we will say our confession together as a church body. Together then. Most merciful Father, our creator and judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
my strength to cast out fears. No other Well, I hope you enjoyed the time with us so far. We finished now with some church family news. Just to let you know that house groups are back on, so Wednesday night, Thursday night, Hebrews, Mark, respectively. I've really been enjoying and getting a lot from our, uh, the group I'm involved with, which is uh, Wednesday night through Hebrews. Highlight of my week, and I genuinely mean that, and I'm sure the Thursday night one is also going strong. So uh, do join in. The more people who join in on House Group, it makes it so much better for everyone else. If we all turn up and we all really go for it for an hour, an hour and a half, it makes such a difference to the rest of the group. And we can all benefit from uh, each other's comments and thoughts and prayers and so on. If you're a, a woman and you would love to be involved with the book they're reading, they're going through real change, uh, do get in touch. Uh, the more the merrier with, with that, I think. And uh, it's a lovely way to be knitted in to church life. And then finally, I suppose, just an appeal um, on, off the back of Wednesday night to consider each other. So wouldn't it be wonderful if over the next seven days, we all said, I would love to receive some texts personally, but I'm also gonna be a sender of texts. And it could be a text, an email, a Zoom call, a request to go walking on the downs or walking through the woods together. And that would be a great way of supporting each other. If everybody at church tried to contact two or three people this week at least, then we will easily cover the church family in this area of looking after each other and looking out for one another. It's when we forget to do that and the week slips by and we get to Friday, Saturday, it's too late uh, to arrange to meet up or something. Um, that people feel neglected and ignored. So try and get in there early in the first half of the week and that way we will give each other an opportunity to arrange something. It, it is totally legal now to uh, meet up in small groups uh, if you want to go for a stroll on the downs, obviously staying a, an appropriate distance apart. But um, with those things in mind, why don't we close in prayer and then we'll head on over immediately afterwards to our Zoom groups. Heavenly Father, considering the talk we've heard today, we pray, Father, that you would forgive us for where we have been like the temple leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. We thank you, Lord, that we can claim forgiveness in Christ. We pray that this would transform us in this week coming up. Please make us more like the people you would like us to be. We ask this in your name. Amen. See you in just a few moments. Grab that cup of tea, coffee, cake, whatever it is you want to grab, and see you over on Zoom. Bye-bye.